when you talk about things like body language, you know, I'm thinking of different athletes. I'm, I'm actually first thinking of golfer. I mean, Rory McIlroy sort of seems like the most obvious example of when he's playing well, he's just strutting down the fairway. And, you know, years ago when he's winning by eight or 10 shots and it just, even the competition could see that. And it was almost like, there's no, ch- we got no chance here. He's going to win by a mile. When he wasn't playing well, uh, you know, he, he, the shoulders was slump and he'd be sort of dragging the putter behind him and these types of things. And, you know, he's even mentioned this even recently with his obviously still incredible successes, but to his level, wanting more majors is obviously, you know, a high bar. Can you talk to this, the body language story? Because it is, it is amazing how, how our body is impacting our mind and, and vice versa. Yeah, it's such a good point that you're making because, you know, you could almost look at the four wheels of a sports car, you know, in the sense that you have kind of mind, emotion, physiology, and then more kind of like, you know, body language or posture, and they all influence Mm -hmm. each other. So, you know, as an example, if you put a big frown on your face and look down at your feet, it's hard to feel happy. And, you know, Mm -hmm. versus if you looked up with a big smile on your face and kind of had your hands up in the air, it's, it's hard to feel sad. So all these systems are kind of working with each other. And Mm -hmm. so sometimes we need to act our way into a certain way of feeling versus, you know, maybe feel ourselves into a certain way of acting. So I like the idea of act as if. So when you're not playing well, act as if you're about to turn things around or act as if your spirit can't be broken. And, you know, I like the saying that uh, body language is a billboard for your mental toughness. And so when your body language is down, you're telling the other team, beat me now. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I can't do this. And then you're also giving the message to your teammates that you can't count on me. So to me, body language is one of those things where, uh, man, you really got to act like a champion. And so I'll encourage athletes, you know, especially practice this in your preparation, but, you know, walk with a little bit of a swagger or strut when you're not feeling your best, make that a habit. So walk like a champion, even when you have doubts, or especially when you have doubts or fears. Yeah. And there's an interesting sort of middle ground of we've had athletes where they're sort of performing well, but their body language is very neutral in a sense that even the coaches will comment on almost like your story previously about the soccer player of, you know, how much do they want to be here? How much do they really want this? Are they really, you know, it doesn't look like they're giving a hundred percent even in practice. Whereas, you know, we can tell even by the you know, the internal physiological metrics that, that they are. Um, and so how do you give suggestions on how a coach might broach that subject? Cause it's almost like for some of these players, they just need to show more better body language, let's say, because sometimes these are those players that are, you know, not, not necessarily starters. They're on the, they're on the bench or maybe potentially not on the team anymore. And there's a, there's a fine line. And it seems like this is actually playing a big role into terms of how their personality is, is impacting the team or their the perception from the, from the staff of the personality impacting the rest of the players. Yeah, that's definitely one area where there could definitely be miscommunication. Um, you know, I've had athletes that are more introverted. And mm-hmm. so, you know, coach or teammates might read into that, like, oh, they don't care. They're yeah. not interested. They don't want to be here when they do. It's just, they're not as demonstrative in, you know, in terms of their body language. Um, I do think that you have to do businesses, you know, businesses being done. So, you know, if you're part of a team, I think you have to challenge yourself to, you know, even though it might not be your personality to, to give the team what it needs. And that might be being a little bit more loud and proud in practice and in games. You know, I like John Calipari at Kentucky basketball. He'll tell his guys like, Hey, you don't have to talk outside of practice. You know, if you're a quiet guy, be quiet outside of practice. But when you come into practice, you better be loud. You better be proud. You better be talkative because we need that as a team. But I do think that for coaches or staff, when they see a player like that, you know, assume that they're coming from a place of maybe they're a little shy or a little introverted rather than, you know, we tend to make these uh, negative attributions, you mm-hmm. know, versus trying to understand them first. Like, hey, you know, it seems like, you know, you're, you're a little bit more quiet with your body language. You know, what's that all about? You know, are, are, you, are you tend to be more introverted or more shy? How can I help you to bring that out so yeah. that we show that great attitude that I know you have inside of you? Uh, versus, hey, you know, shape up, you know, like, you know, yeah. kind of yelling at them because then they feel shamed, embarrassed, and and you're com- kind of coming from a negative that's not going to yeah. help them. Yeah, no, for sure. And it reminds me of uh, the idea of the, of the player not giving it all in the training. I think it was with Maurice Green quote around, you know, on race day, on competition day, acting like you're the number one, you're the best. 
But on, when we're training, we've got to act like we're, we're, we're number two or number three. We've got to really be able to bring that. Can you talk about that shift in mindset of, of how the training mindset, which often, you know, in nutrition, we talk about even training nutrition versus game day nutrition. And it's a similar theme in terms of mindset, no? Yeah. I mean, you know, practice is one of those things where how do I get one day better today? And, and you need to find a way to do that. Again, some guys are a little more introverted. Some guys are a little more extroverted. So when I was with the San Francisco giants, it was interesting about half the team, uh, the guys who kind of, you know, like, let's say on the, on, a, on the plane or the bus, they would kind of be just kind of in their own little world, just kind of real quiet, mm -hmm. uh, maybe on their phone or reading a book. And then the other half of the team would be playing cards and really loud and obnoxious and, mm -hmm. you know, and having fun and telling jokes and kind of ribbing each other. But you know, in terms of practices versus game day, ideally you want to practice the way you want to play and then play the way that you want to practice. Uh, I think the biggest mistake that the average athlete have has is, you know, practice doesn't really matter, you know, which, which I would say, yeah, but it still counts. And uh, yeah, for sure, but if you're waiting to turn it on during, you know, you know, flipping the switch on game day, lots of luck because, you know, you've kind of practiced not thinking like a champion or training like a champion. So, uh, to me, you really want to have the attitude that, you know, practice is the big day. And then, you know, if I practice like a champion, then it's easy to go out there and just play like a champion when it matters most. Absolutely. And, you know, in today's environment with, again, thinking sort of basketball, a lot of training load and, and brings to mind the Allen Iverson quote about practice. And of course, agree hundred percent with all the greats, like the Michael Jordans and the Tom Brady's and the intensity they would bring, they bring to practice to be able to be exact and to be able to be champions. You know, today we see obviously a lot of players doing that as well. We also see this sort of training load and, and guys maybe going through the paces a little bit in practice, that mindset of what you just described, how would we start to instill that the idea that we do still need to bring it in practice because on, on game day, this is, as you mentioned, you're not going to be able to just flip the switch. Yeah, I love the quote from Kobe Bryant, uh, the one where he said, you know, it's not how many minutes you put into your practice, it's how many minutes your mind is into your practice. Oh, and, nice, yeah. And, and so, you know, it's really about being where your feet are, as we say now. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say be where your fangs are because you want to be you want to be a predator. You know, yeah. you want to be like, I'm, you know, I love to hunt. I'm here to attack. Yeah. So it's really about presence, I would say. So measure your practices by the degree of presence. So what I would see is that, you know, some players that were pretty good, you, know, you can tell that their mind is elsewhere, you know, mm -hmm. during different drills or different parts of practice, especially near the end of practice, when we kind of just want to get to the finish line. Yeah. Whereas the better players that I'd be around, better athletes, they almost would, you know, have the attitude, I'm going to run through the finish line at practice. So I almost want to be, man, like when practice ends, I'm going to be surprised because I'm so focused in terms mm -hmm. of what I'm doing. So to me, it's about, you know, high quality effort rather than just logging minutes, you know, and kind of, you know, you could use it, you could say kind of like garbage time. Yeah. And shifting gears here a little bit, Doc, I know you've got uh, kids at home and I've got three young girls and this idea of young athletes and how we can support building a strong mindsets and kids, not just to make them great athletes, but also, you know, life skills. And, you know, you talk about the idea of commenting on, you know, your, your child, your kid's attitude, their effort, but trying to avoid some of these sort of technical or tactical suggestions, which, you know, being from Canada, ice hockey, this is a lot of hockey moms and dads giving suggestions out there. You know, why is that? Well, I think it's important to, you know, number one is realize how hard the game is. Um, I was just out in Detroit working with Honey Baked uh, Hockey Club. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's the biggest hockey club in the U.S. And uh, so we did some parent workshops and, you know, we we're talking about before the game, you know, not a lot of instruction uh, because, you know, if someone was telling me before I did something like, Hey, remember this or remember that I'm thinking, well, do they even trust me or believe in me? <laughs> you know? So that would kind of hurt my confidence or just fill my mind up. And I just be this kind of bloated bobblehead of information. Mm -hmm. So thumbs up, you know, pat on the back, you know, like, um, you know, just a little bit of you just, you know, like, hey, you know, go out there and do what you do. And I'm going to have fun watching it during the game, compete against other parents to see who could have the most fun, you know, trust nice. that your kid's going to be OK. And if there's a little bit of adversity, great. You know, it's, it's an opportunity for them to kind of develop some of that mental muscle. And then after the game, um, you know, that car ride home is, you know, that that's where, you know, hey, maybe we'll save the analysis till later and just, hey, I love watching you play. 
I'm so proud of you. What was, you know, your favorite part of the game, that kind of stuff. But I do think that, you know, one of the things I like to say is let the coaches be the coaches in terms of the instruction. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you're there for support and encouragement. But I do think that kids can pick up a lot from the mental game in terms of, you know, the breathing, the body language, gratitude, you know, what were, what are you grateful for? What are you thankful for on your team? Uh, All these mental skills and strategies, you know, goal setting, visualization, they could pick up these at a young age. And what's great, and I always love to hear this from student athletes is, man, this really helps me in the classroom, or this really Mm -hmm. helps me at work. This helps me in other areas of my life. So I would say is, you know, there's a little bit of a concern that, well, you know, with parents or others that, you know, you don't want to start kids too young with the mental game. Whereas actually, it probably should be the core of their game when they're young, because these truly are life skills. And it's not to make them more professional. It's to give, it's to equip them with the, you know, the know-how and the skills to really be resilient, mentally tough, and not only to play better, but to have more fun. 